you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode seven. Now, before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to Kristen Perrin in Ottawa for her comments on Instagram. Quote, I finally had a moment to listen to your new podcast. I love it. Thank you for sharing. P.S. You have a soothing CBC voice. Oh, thank you, Kristen. Or should I say, thank you, Kristen. I'm just kidding. You can find Kristen on Instagram at kippy underscore sips underscore wine. She's sharing some terrific wines there that she's been enjoying lately, so connect with her. I'm going to continue to give a shout out to others who've been kind enough to leave a review on social media or Apple, so if you want me to mention your website or social media handle, please include that in your review. Meanwhile, thanks to you, this podcast is holding steady on Apple's top 10 food and drink podcasts, the only one that's drink-related. Yay! (laughs) Seriously, this would not happen without you. Thank you. Now, back to this episode. We're chatting with the New York Times best-selling author, Bianca Bosker, who goes behind the scenes of the wine world in her new book, Cork Dork. She's smart, witty, and very wine-wise. I know you're going to love her. Would you like an insider look at the wine world? I mean, a real sneak peek behind the scenes. Well, that's exactly what our next guest is going to reveal for us. She's got some fantastic stories, some insider tips. She's a superb writer. Our guest this evening is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Cork Dork. I love this subtitle. A wine-fueled adventure among the obsessive sommeliers, big bottle hunters, and rogue scientists who taught me to live for taste. Love that. It's been described as the kitchen confidential of wine, if you remember Anthony Bourdain's book. She has written about food, wine, architecture, and technology for The New Yorker Online, The Atlantic, The New York Times, Food and Wine Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, The New Republic, among many other publications. And she joins me from her home in New York City. Welcome, Bianca Bosker. Thanks for having me. What a wonderful way to spend a Sunday evening. Excellent. We always have fun and we are so glad you are here with us. So Bianca, I just gave you a high level intro there. Fill in the details of anything I've left out. Maybe tell us something that would surprise us about you. Yeah. So I would maybe start with some background, which is that I was not a wine connoisseur when Mm. I started. I liked wine. I was curious about wine, but I had spent five years as the executive tech editor at the Huffington Post. And my journey into wine started when I discovered the world of pork dorks. Pork dork is not just a book title. It is the restaurant industry's nickname for the most obsessed and knowledgeable wine lovers among them. It happened when I discovered something called the Best Sommelier in the World competition, which if you've never seen it, is essentially the Westminster dog show with booze. (laughs) I love that description. This is part of the gorgeous prose that you have, the way of capturing (laughs) that. That's fantastic. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, think about these well-groomed specimens walking in a circle, very high stakes. And it was for me, this introduction, I'd always thought of wine as a thing of pleasure, Mm -hmm. but I realized that there's this world of cork dorks who turn it into something almost approaching pain. You know, they (laughs) go to the rocks to train their palace, they divorce their spouses to spend more time studying. I was really intrigued. Why wine? Why do people spend all this time and money and effort on something that at the end of the day turns into expensive tea? you know, we're doing the best we can here, but Mm -hmm. tech is sterile, right? I mean, it's very two-dimensional. And this world of wine is that taste and smell and these neglected senses and physical pleasures. And I wanted to know, what was I missing? 
So I quit my job, started over as a seller rat, which is the lowest of the low. And from there, I started training to become a sommelier. I think, Natalie, your book was about a journey from grape to glass. Uh I consider Cork Direct really a journey from glass to gullet. The connoisseurs, the culture, the science of taste, really the wild, obsessive world of connoisseurship in all different forms. That's fantastic. You are full of sound bites, very intelligent (laughs) sound bites. So your book has been described as the kitchen confidential of the wine world. We know kitchen confidential for the diehards here. Anthony Bourdain, insider look at the restaurant world. Why do you think your book was described like that? I think that it is really this in-depth personal look. Oftentimes with the wine world, I think that there's a script that has worked very well for a very long time, and it is heavy on the romance and the tradition and the fairy tale. And I think Cork Dark pulls back the curtain on parts of the wine world that we haven't heard as much about. To me, the reality is so much messier and more complicated than the romantic fairy tale that we tend to hear about with wine. And so I think that that's part of it, is that it is the warts it's also, I think, still about soul. And, and at the end of the day, what is the mystery and the beauty and the pleasure? I learned a mindset in a glass of wine that doesn't stop at the table, that has really changed the way I experience music, my own work, walks through Central Park in New York. But I think it's really that first person element. I mean, I was dissecting cadavers, with neuroscientists, I was working the floor at Michelin star restaurants. So there's that very immersive quality, I think. Absolutely. And you're the George Plimpton of the wine world. So George Plimpton was a journalist. I'm sure you are aware, Bianca, but it was back in the 60s or 70s. And whatever he wrote about, he would do. So he became a football player. He did everything to get those deeper, more colorful insights to really feel what this was like. You're combining him with the elegance of talking in paragraphs of The New Yorker. So you've got the twinning of both worlds, which is amazing. Kitchen Confidential, I also found it not to diminish the gorgeous, gorgeous prose, but also a gossipy great book. I love the gossip and the real housewives of New York sommeliers (laughs) kind of thing that was going on. The insider look. So do people really have acronyms and have little note, Colts notes versions for their wine heavy hitters when they come to the restaurant, they know what to serve them or how much they're going to spend? Yeah, so what Natalie's referring to, if you haven't read the book, is I did a a stage or a trail apprenticeship at Morea, which is a two Michelin star restaurant, and also at Oriole, actually, here in New York. And it forever changed the way I eat out at restaurants. One of the things that was really revelation is the fact that many of these high-end restaurants are really judging you even more than you're judging them. And they're Googling you before you come in. They're keeping extensive logs on what you order, your pet peeves, personal preferences, your relationship with the restaurant, your dining history. And if you spend a lot of money, you could be a wine PX, which is short for personne extraordinaire. Spend a whole hell of a lot of money. You might be labeled a PPX, which is personne particulièrement extraordinaire. If you're a temper tantrum, you might be an HWC, which is short for handle with care. Oh. Or a SOE, which is sense of entitlement. We have a lot of those in New York. There is a logic to it. On the surface, it can seem perhaps mercenary, but First of all, they are businesses. I mean, liquid keeps restaurants liquid. And so I think yeah, that when you're spending a lot of money on wine, I mean, in some ways, it's the progressive tax rate of the restaurant world, right? Sure. Everyone spends the same amount in salad. Some people spend more on a bottle of wine. And yeah. you help keep the lights on. And that's great. But there's also an emotional thing. Really what a sommelier does, it's not just about delivering calories. It's about understanding what your guest wants emotionally and sort of psychologically from the meal. To me, there's actually a great beauty and care and respect that comes from service. I think that there's the deeper story to it that might meet the eye. Absolutely. And I've heard it said that the sommelier doesn't sell the bottle to the customer. The sommelier sells the customer to the customer, that you're worth this. This is who you are. And not in a manipulative way, but I see you and I think this is you with the wine. Mm. And of course, the old adage is customers will eat you poor and drink you rich. (laughs) The margin is all in the liquids, not just the wine, but the coffee, the water, et cetera. That's what keeps the overhead going, right? Yeah, obviously wines get marked up. And I think that before I spent time in the restaurant world, training and working as a psalm, I mean, I would feel a little had sometimes. 
I would sort of think, well, okay, there's like a 3X markup, so I could have bought it for less if, if I got it from my retail store on the corner. And the reality is sometimes you can't find those bottles at a retail store. And the other piece of it is, if you believe in the role that restaurants play, be it in creating a culture, creating a neighborhood, creating an experience, in ordering that coffee, that tea, that bottle of wine, you're helping to make it possible. I mean, these are yes. low margin businesses for the most part. That's so true. I think that that extra that you might spend on a bottle of wine, that's paying for the staff's wages. It's paying yes. for the insurance. It's paying for the rent, the napkins that you use that night. So you shouldn't feel bad. I do think you should feel no. good if you believe in the value of restaurants. You should yes. feel good that you're helping to support these small businesses. Absolutely. Restaurants, restoratives. Absolutely. By the way, there's a part of Cork Dark about the history of restaurants. Ah. I mean, restaurants, the actually original word came from the French hustle hall, which okay. means which was a soup. And originally a restaurant or a hustle hall was a restoring sort of broth that was served. And restaurants really invented these for a long time. There wasn't a place that you could go out and order from a variety of options on a menu. You know, you would go one place for a chicken, one place for beef, one place for your bread. And they really emerged right around pre-revolutionary France. So I don't know if that's what you're referring to with the restorative, but in fact, the origins of the words come from a restorative broth that would mm. be this institution. I'm sort of referring to that, but I'm thinking more <laughs> Pinot Noir as restorative. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. all of the above. Yeah. You skip the broth. Give me Pinot Noir. <laughs> Bianca, I want to get back into this because there's just so much in your book that I absolutely love. So you binge watch the psalm competition and you found that some psalms were licking rocks. Do you lock in the aroma memory of rocks based on red slate, blue slate by licking them? So there were some liaise that basically <laughs> that was their training regimen. Others didn't buy it. And I've tried it. I have done it partially because I wanted to fact check tasting notes. You hear a lot of psalms talk about a whetstone minerality to your wine or a wine that smells like potting soil. Well, if you yeah. want to smell potting soil in a wine, you've got to smell potting soil and potting soil, right? Sure. Uh, so I think that what that really speaks to is this broader idea that you need to develop your sense memory. This goes back to this idea of savoring taste and smell, of learning to attach meaning to odors. I turn to psalms like Morgan to be my mentors, but also master perfumers, sensory scientists. And if you're interested in doing it for yourself, what I would suggest is, this is the advice that I received, start smelling everything around you and describing its smell. Taste your notes for your shampoo in the morning. What are you smelling? Is it maybe a little artificial passion fruit? artificial green apple, perhaps this is my shampoo, <laughs> you know, black pepper, right? You talk a lot about Syrah smelling like black pepper. You're putting black pepper in your food at night. Smell it, describe it. Again, it's like learning a new vocab word or learning a new language, but instead of putting meaning on a sound, you're putting meaning on an odor. Yeah. So I think that that's where that mentality comes from. Why not? It might help you. The grogs, <laughs> yes, just depends on where you are. I've advised people to smell their leather furniture, but just make sure no one's looking. Right? It's like you're going to be carted off somewhere if you're sniffing your furniture. But it's true. If you cut vegetables and fruit open, that's when they're the most pungent. Smell them. As you're preparing to cook or to serve dinner, cut it open. That's when you're going to develop that aroma vocabulary and remember it in your mind. Psalms that I taste with in my blind tasting groups, quince, for example, this comes up a lot as a tasting note. And to master it, they would smell quince when they first bought it, a more unripe quince, and then quince as it matured. And then they might actually cook the fruit. Talking about apple, right? What's a fresh apple? What's a bruised apple? Does it change? If you think about tasting notes, and I also talk about the history of tasting notes in Cork York because they are not as traditional as they seem. I came right. up really around the 70s. Mm-hmm. So I think that if you hear Psalms talking about the smell of baked apple, bake an apple. <laughs> you know, that's a <laughs> good true. way to figure out if you, if you think really a difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this has been not a dry conversation so far, but one without wine, Bianca. Mm-hmm. So where shall we start? I think you suggested a dry Riesling from an old world country that was older. They can't exactly match your New York selection, but I have Cuvée d'Albert from 2002, Alsace, which I know is going to be dry as opposed to German Riesling. Not that Germany doesn't produce dry Rieslings. What do you have? 
I'm drinking a 2016 Keller. It is a dry Riesling from the Rhine Hessen. Ah, this is lovely. I yes. actually shared it this afternoon at lunch. I used to spend a lot of weekday mornings drinking a lot of wine. It's funny, now I actually, on the weekends, I usually take it a little bit slower because there's still a pleasure that I get. I mean, I get an inordinate amount of pleasure from drinking wine, but it's not every Sunday that I'm opening up a bottle in the daytime, but this was a special day. Actually, it's a really, really lovely German Riesling. I'm enjoying mine. Yeah, cheers. Absolutely. (laughs) This is a gorgeous dry wine that I've got, and you've got a slightly younger wine. Did a mature dry Riesling play some part in your book? So I have had some incredible ones that I've always a pleasure. I think that I oftentimes might look at a list and go off of age. I mean, I think it's so special. Those of you who haven't tried older wines, you don't have to be a break the bank sort of extravagance. And sometimes I may not know that much about the producer, but just for that pleasure of trying some of these different odors that evolve in a wine as they get older, it's such a pleasure. But yeah, actually, I would say Riesling played a big part in my journey. I ended up working for Paul Greco. He's a Canadian. Uh, He's a Canadian, yes. Yes. (laughs) So Paul Greco runs a restaurant called Terroir. And he is the self-described overlord of Riesling. (laughs) And he still does a summer of Riesling. He used to have a more militant summer of Riesling where (laughs) he would essentially serve not a single white wine by the glass if it wasn't Riesling. So if you came into the restaurant and wanted a glass of Sauvignon Blanc, it was sort of like, here's a Riesling. (laughs) You know, if you wanted a Chardonnay, here's a Riesling. And he wanted to champion what he considered a really forgotten, a bit of a maligned underdog of a grape. Riesling has enjoyed great popularity among sommeliers, right? It has generally higher acid. Psalms tend to refer to themselves as acid hounds, right? (laughs) I think acid can sound like a negative thing in a wine, but really that's so much of what gives it this interesting zing and character. So it's a good thing. And if you don't know how to taste acid in the wine, take the wine, take a mm-hmm. sip of it. Yes. I'm about to do it right now because I'm talking. Swallow it, put the tip of your tongue on the roof of your mouth, and then lean forward so your face is parallel to the floor. And ask yourself, if you opened your mouth right now, would you drool? And ah. the more you feel like you're going to drool, the higher the acid in the wine because we sell the response to acid. Anyway, so Paul, I, you know, I think Riesling gets forgotten, especially here in the U.S. People tend to assume that it's sweet. And I think that we're missing out. There's a lot going on in a glass of Riesling. I mean, some of them smell like gas stations in the best <laughs> of the word. I get um, it. I get it's it. It's an acquired taste sometimes. I like to go with Riesling because I think that it's got zing. It's got attitude, which are also qualities that I think would describe cork dork. Yes, and yeah. you as well. You have zing and interesting. So, Absolutely. Does Paul Greco still operate Hearth as well? They split, actually. He's not there now, but he did. Hearth is another restaurant. You guys come to New York in the East Village that's still there, still going strong. But Paul is not doing the day to day. I need to visit his new restaurant then because I have been to Hearth, but not the new one. That is so amazing. Maybe tell us a little bit about La Palais, the Ooh. wine orgy for the rich. So once I did my stage at Morea, I got very interested in really understanding the experience and psychology of collectors. These yep. wine PXs, people who are not sommeliers, what is it that brings them to wine? What is the pleasure they get from a great bottle of wine? As part of my deep dive into this, I went to what is really the most extravagant gathering of wine collectors on the planet, or so it was described to me, which is called La Polite. And it's this gathering of Burgundy aficionados that takes place every other year in New York. If you can imagine the grand event, the gala dinner, that is a $1,500 BYOB dinner. You're expected to bring treasures from your cellar. And basically, there's this sort of accepted rule that no matter who you are, whatever you bring should hurt a little bit. So if you are the head of an investment bank, well, that's a particular kind of pain. And if you're (laughs) an aspiring sommelier ex-journalist, that's a different kind of pain. As one sommelier put it to me who was there, it's like having thousands of pounds of foie gras shoveled in your face. It is over the top. It is excess. It is drunken. There are chefs crowd surfing. I mean, men being totally in a 
appropriate. I mean, it's everything. <laughs> but I think for me, it was also ultimately a fascinating glimpse into this very complicated question of what we really experience when we experience a bottle of wine. I'm sure you've read these gotcha studies about how wine experts can't tell the difference between a red wine and yes. a white wine. And to me, what La Palais was illustrative of is the fact that you know, when we taste a bottle of wine, this flavor, our experience of it is not just taste and smell. It is this composite of taste and smell, expectation, price, who we're drinking the wine with, you know, mm. what the color of the room is, the music that's playing. And in a way that we, we don't realize, I think a lot of us don't grasp, we are deeply multisensory creatures, which means that price is a spice, sounds can have tastes, colors can affect flavor. Huh. And I think that it's important to be aware of those. If you really want to taste subjectively, I think it's critical that we become aware of the way that these different inputs influence us. And on the other hand, I think that there are times when we can let ourselves enjoy a bottle of wine because it's just special. For example, I mean, when Cork Dork hit the bestseller list, when I was at La Polea, there was a woman whose seatmate asked her if a wine could ever be better than sex. And <laughs> her answer was, without even pausing for a second, Vega Cecilia. And I was like, okay, I have to try that wine. <laughs> um, and so when Cork Dork hit the, the <laughs> bestseller list, my husband and I celebrated with a bottle of Vega Cecilia. And look, I came to that wine with very high expectations. It was not inexpensive. It was a special wine. And in that moment, I think I did sort of allow myself to suspend disbelief. I was definitely aware. I mean, it was an incredible wine. I really let myself just enjoy that experience. And of course, again, I, I think I was biased by the occasion and the price and the label and my expectations. Sure. But in that moment, that was the perfect experience to have. Wow. So is orgasmic? Well, I don't know if I would go that far, <laughs> but sorry. it was as close as you can get from a bottle of wine, I guess. It Excellent. Was... <laughs> That's a good wine. We're all going to hunt it down. After all of this that you've done, Bianca, what do you think the most important thing is for the sommelier to do? I think sommeliers are deeply, first of all, misunderstood. We live in this sort of celebrity chef cult era, right? Where I think chefs have been really celebrated because they're the ones that play with knives. They have flames. They're the <laughs> sexy bad boys of the restaurant world. And in fact, I think we're beginning to see the dark side to that. I mean, you've seen at least here in the States and perhaps you've followed it as well, the real toll that that takes, whether it's in terms of sexual harassment in the yeah. workplace, the also yeah. physical kind of psychological toll that that takes into people that are working in the industry. But I think at the same time, the you know, Psalms operate in a very geeky, much more nuanced kind of tension, right? They have flashcards, they memorize the weather 30 years ago. So on the outside, they can seem like nerds, but to me, they're kind of the Olympic gymnasts of the restaurant world where what they do looks deceptively easy because it has to, right? The point is for it to be elegant. Now, to me, I think mm -hmm. as part of that, we underestimate some ways. And to me, the most important thing is that they're storytellers. I mean, they are creating an experience through flavors in a glass. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, they play a more literal function, of course, in terms of helping keeping restaurants afloat. But what Morgan helped me see is the way that a sommelier is, it's a type of performance. It is very much a skill and a service. It has parallels with art. I mean, I think that the magic of a glass of wine is to me, predictably, and with more consistency, a glass of wine can really nudge us into a place where we're wondering about the world and our place in it much more regularly than food can. I have next to me a bottle of wine from yeah. Slovenia. I have a bottle of wine from my native state of Oregon, yes. of course, Germany. And there's something really magical about this ability to travel through time and space in a glass. I can smell the smells of Slovenia. I can smell the smells of Oregon through these bottles. And you can return in, in a way to 2002 in that beautiful amber color Riesling that you have in front it's of you. It's true. It's true. Okay, so you sort of got to it. I'm going to push the point. Why can wine get you there faster than food? Is it because of the ageability and you can go back in time with a bottle as opposed to a sauerkraut that's right here right now and that's all you're going to get? I think that wine has a sensory complexity that to me 
it's more complex than food at times. I mean, I, I think and, so. Yeah. And I think that that's so powerful about a glass of wine is, so I'm a big, obviously, proponent of smell. And I think that a lot of us think that what we do with the wine is we should drink it. And it's true, we do drink it. But if you're just drinking the wine, you're not taking that time to really relish the smell, you're missing so much of the yes. nuance of it. And I think that a smell, as many of you know, is one of the most emotional senses. It's one of the ones most tied to memory. When I say that it can really nudge us into a place where we're questioning our place in the world, I think for me at least, I think that every glass of wine has a story to tell. And some of those stories are not that interesting. And some of those stories might be interesting because you're smelling the smells of a foreign place you've never been to before. Perhaps you're smelling 1949 France. Or perhaps you're smelling a glass of wine that for reasons you can't quite explain at first are making you think of a hike you took with your cousin mm. through the forest, or it's making you think about a particular summer you may have spent on the coast of Massachusetts. And I think that wine has this ability to speak to us in a way that is both physical and intellectual. At the end of the day, it doesn't always have to be that experience. There's also times where you open up a glass of wine. It's more about the people that you're sharing with, perhaps, than it is about the liquid in the glass. I think that's okay, too. It doesn't always have to be totally high-minded. Absolutely. Okay. So we've done the Alsace. Let's get to the wines you suggested. Shall we go to Oregon or Lebanon first? Let's start with Oregon. What are okay. you thinking? I have got Domaine Druin, mm. Pinot Noir, which I love and what we've got up here in our availability. And it is spectacular. It is medium bodied, smooth, supple. What have you got? You've got Teutonic something, right? Teutonic is a phenomenal wine. I had it on Saturday night. But tonight, I'm actually experimenting with something. This is a new wine okay. for me. Um, right. It's Harper Voigt is the winemaker. I've never tried this before. It's a Pinot Blanc from oh. the Lemmet Valley. It's about some time. Oh, Harper Voigt. All right. Pinot Blanc. Yeah. And it's cool. I think that Paul, going back to Paul, my wine yes. mentors, he used to make people promise to never drink the same wine twice. And to me, there's a logic to that. I think that sort of Ever. like books. Well, there was no asterisk when he said it, but <laughs> you can add one if you really want one. But I was just gonna say, I think that it's sort of like books, right? I mean, there's more books than you'll ever get through in a lifetime. It's true. But we have certain books that we return to yes. year after year and they change each time. Or we change. In relation to them. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, why not experiment? So for this wine, you really just need two pieces of information to create, get a great wine. And it's what do you want to spend and what flavors do you want? So I got this wine, went to one of my local wine stores. And I was sort of, this is my budget. I want something from Oregon. Let's have an adventure. Great um, attitude. Yeah. Just experiment with it. Well, and for those of you, if you like Pinot Noir, try Teutonic makes some really cool Pinot Noirs from Oregon. And I've also been very into German Pinot Noir recently. Yes, me too. If you too. haven't tried that, I think it's a great bang for the buck. And it has similar qualities to some Burgundian Pinot Noir. That edgy um, acidity, that yeah. spat Burgunder. Yes, that's yeah. not nearly as expensive. So Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, Domaine Druin, I'm loving this. Did that play a pivotal part or somewhat of a story in your book, Bianca? For me, Oregon, it's more personal. I mean, I think that there's this ability to sort of embrace wine as a way of time traveling yes. is real. I mean, I, I do sometimes when I'm getting homesick, I go and look for a bottle of very classic Oregon Pinot Noir because it often has this earthy, wet leaf smell that I associate with my childhood. And so I think just for me as, as a personal level, it speaks to this idea of using wine to travel through time and space. I love that. Time travel through wine. I love it. <laughs> I love it. That just encapsulates it. It's so lovely. Oh, it's right. very transportative. I mean, I think we oftentimes we turn to it because it can be a bit of an escape. And then you know, it brings people together. One of the things I love about wine is it's almost impossible to rush it, right? We don't yes. take shots of wine for no. the most part, right? right? I mean, it's something that you linger, it's social. As you get further down in the bottle, conversation flows a little bit yeah. more fluidly. It's Absolutely. <laughs> There's no wine shots. I love that. It's a slow drink, slow food, slow drink. Yeah. Did you once bring some sort of cup 
or vessel of Cherville. Cherville, how am I pronouncing? Cherville, yeah. Cherville. Did you bring that to a wine tasting and see? Yes. What did, what did you do? <laughs> I made myself into a pain in the butt. I was working towards taking the Court of Master Sommelier's Certified Sommelier exam, which is sort of the gold standard for working the floor. And as part of that training, I was able to embed myself with a number of different blind tasting groups that were run by aspiring master sommeliers, which meant I was tasting with people who were way above my level, which was great. It was phenomenal mentorship. One weekend when it was my turn to captain the group, I was in charge of bringing the wines. But I also was curious because, as I mentioned, I got very interested in these tasting notes. And when Psalms would be reciting the tasting notes for these wines, they would rattle off what seemed kind of like dubious odors. I mean, sometimes it sounded like a book of Wiccan love spells, you know, baby's <laughs> breath, sweat, Robitussin, desiccated pepper, pomegranate, sherbel, and like sherbel came up a lot. And shrivel, I thought, was maybe related to a rodent. Like, I wasn't sure yeah. if it was like a gerbil. Yeah. And shrivel is, of course, if you are better educated in herbs than I was, it's an herb. And so I showed up with smell standards to basically see, well, if these sommeliers smelled shrivel in wine, surely they could smell shrivel in shrivel. I brought little you know, solo cups, covered them with aluminum foil, poked holes in them. They were mushrooms in one, pomegranate seeds in another, grass, we had some shervil, and the performance when it came to blind tasting these odors was pretty hit and miss. And that set me off on this quest to really understand how it is that we can be more precise in our language around smell and why that's so important. And I would say it's a great exercise. I mean, I'm actually looking right now at something called Le Nez du Vin, oh, yes. uh, which was yes. a combination birthday Christmas present from a couple of years ago. Well, you know, I was really in the midst of training my nose. And what it recommends is basically these different aromas, essential oils that mimic the common odors in wines so that you can begin to really train yourself to figure out what does lilac smell like? What does grass Mm -hmm. smell like? And so, you know, get a friend and and put yourself through those paces. Blind smell cinnamon, blind smell black pepper, whatever you have in your spice cabinet to begin to really teach yourself it's harder than you think, I will say, but it's yeah. very critical if you want to pick up those odors and nuance in a glass of wine. Absolutely. This has gone amazingly fast, which is a tribute to you, Bianca. So I'm oh. going to go into the lightning round. I'm going to ask you quick questions, fast answers, and then we'll wrap up. Right. Okay. So what is the best piece of wine advice you've ever received? I never try the same wine twice. That was Paul's advice, but it's opened up so many universes for me. That's fantastic. What is the one thing you were wrong about when it comes to making wine or about wine in general? I would say that going into this process, I thought that in order to wine taste wines, in order to pick up the nuances of chervil and gasoline in a wine, that you had to be born a bloodhound. There was (laughs) a sort of genetic ability, like being an Olympic athlete, that either you were born with it or you weren't. And in fact, any of us can train ourselves to do it. Fabulous. Okay. If you could share one bottle of wine with anyone outside the wine world, living or dead, who would that person be? Oh, I would throw such a good dinner party, but I would invite lots of people. Populate Uh, your dinner table. I think I would give God knows what to have a glass of wine with Joan Didion. I think she's fascinating. And then Mm. Cleopatra. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. You tell me why. (laughs) Wouldn't she be so interesting? Yes. Growing up when I was little, I remember I had an Egyptian themed birthday party. I've just always loved ancient Egypt. So, wow. Yeah. So cool. And strong women, I guess. Right? What would you ask her? Oh, I'd have to prepare a list of questions like any good journalist. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Because I'm springing this on you at the last minute. That's fine. If you could put up a billboard in whatever, downtown Manhattan, Toronto, wherever, about wine, what would you say? This comes from Anne Noble, who's the really the wine Moses wheel of tasting notes. A yeah. Moses. And that's, she wrote the sort of 10 commandments and it came to the language of wine. But, you know, I would say, listen to your nose and drink adventurously, but there would be really great drawings to go along with it. <laughs> I getcha. I'm springing this all on you right now. It's an interesting question. Well, what's the most interesting question you've ever been asked? I will say 
I was doing a book event at a library in Connecticut mm-hmm. and yeah. a lovely older lady came up to me and she said, you know, I haven't finished your book yet, but I just have to know, are you and your husband still together? And then it turned out that many other people had a similar question. A little concerning as I was recently at a lunch with a number of, uh, of book and wine lovers and some of them said, you know, you sound like a real piece of work. I've brought home some great wines from our tasting groups to share with him, but he is indeed a saint and we are still together. I just maybe walking around in the back here somewhere. That question definitely caught me out of the blue. I didn't realize how much of a piece of work I had seemed, I suppose. So yeah, <laughs> but they're all good questions. You know, I think I will say it's so exciting. I love the fact that wine can bring people together and it is Absolutely. such a thrill for me. I mean, I got into this world because I've always been obsessed with obsession and no one does obsession <laughs> like wine lovers. And I've ended even True. more obsessed with the things that they obsess over than I ever could have imagined. And so now when people ask me questions about wine, as you can tell, I have yeah. a lot to talk about and I very much enjoy it. Fantastic. What a delight Bianca is. I love how she playfully described the sommelier competition as the Westminster dog show of the wine world without meaning any disrespect. It is so competitive and high strung. So here are my takeaways from this discussion. One, to get better at smelling and tasting wine, smell and taste everything you can from freshly cut vegetables to your shampoo. Okay, yeah, don't taste your shampoo, but you get the idea. You're learning a new language and attaching meaning to aromas rather than to words. Number two, the markup on restaurant wines is more understandable when you consider all of the costs in creating that experience for you, not just the wine itself. Three, the next time you're in a restaurant, Keep in mind that you may be judged more than the staff you're judging. Are you a PX, a personne extraordinaire, or even a PPX, personne particulière extraordinaire? Hmm. And finally, four, the mindset of many of us who love wine, want to know its soul, doesn't stop at the glass. It's an approach to life and to getting to its essence. I love that. So what was your favorite tip or quote from this episode? Share that with me on Twitter or Facebook and tag me at Natalie McLean or on Instagram. I'm at Natalie McLean wine or use the hashtag unreserved wine talk. So you'll find links to Bianca's social media channels, her book on Amazon and other booksellers and reviews of the wines we discussed, plus bonus tips for this episode at nataliemcclain.com forward slash seven. Next week is a solo confessional episode, and I'll share with you my absolute obsession for those TV women lawyers who love, love their wine. Think Alicia Florick, Olivia Pope, and what that means for our own relationship with wine. And my next guest on the show will be Ezra Sipes of Summerhill Estates Winery in British Columbia who will chat about exactly what is a vegan or a vegetarian wine, and are they better for you than the carnivore kind? So finally, if you want to take your ability to pair wine and food to the next level, as they say, please join me in a free online video class at nataliemcclain.com forward slash class. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.